Good afternoon, and welcome to the latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I'm Ron Granary, and all of us at FPRI welcome you to this event. Thank you for joining us live on Zoom and recorded on the FPRI webpage, uh, FPRI YouTube page, I should say, and the webpage for that matter. For most of the past century, the Middle East has been a focal point of American foreign policy, even as American leaders have spent the better part of the last two decades assuring voters that they plan to pivot away from that fractious region to deal with other more important matters. Yet each new pivot has been more of a pirouette. Attempts to pivot to Asia or to Europe or to bring Americans home often end up returning to where we began with the geopolitical contest for influence in the land between the Mediterranean and the Gobi. In his latest book, The Loom of Time, FPRI's Robert Kaplan offers a survey of the greater Middle East, combining historical and sociological research with the on-the-ground reportage for which he is famous. In his assessment, the region is not a region to pivot away from, but is rather the center of geopolitical competition the very embodiment of the heartland described by the father of geopolitics, Halford Mackinder, whose pathbreaking essay, for those of you who haven't already heard this, was after all entitled The Geographical Pivot of History. The United States and Kaplan's telling need not turn away from this region to confront a rising China. China's right there. The question for Kaplan and for his readers is whether the United States can pursue and defend its interests in the greater Middle East in a way that does not alienate the leaders of the region or drive them into Beijing's embrace. So how is the future being shaped in the greater Middle East? Who will shape it? What if any role should the United States play there? If Washington must put aside values to prevail in an area of realistic competition, what's the conflict all about anyway? These questions and yours will guide us in our conversation with Robert Kaplan. Robert Kaplan, the Robert Strauss who paid chair in geopolitics to FPRI, was twice named one of the world's top 100 global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine. A reporter with decades of experience, he has written 21 books, including Adriatic, The Good American, The Revenge of Geography, Asia's Cauldron, Monsoon, The Coming Anarchy, and Balkan Ghosts. He has served on the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board and the U.S. Navy's Executive Panel, and we are delighted to have him with us today on People, Politics, and Prose. Welcome, Bob Kaplan. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here, Ron. It's always fun to talk to you, Bob. So I got to start with the most obvious question, which ironically, I didn't come up with the first time I sent you the prep memo for this, but you reminded me. So why did you call this book The Loom of Time? Yes, The Loom of Time uh, was a phrase used by the great late British historian Arnold Toynbee, who had gotten the phrase by reading Goethe, um, uh, and Goethe got it, but, you know, it was it, it came from the Odyssey originally. And Penelope, you know, the uh, the wife of Ulysses, of Odysseus, is 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 weaving a on her loom a winding sheet for Odysseus's father, Laertes. A winding sheet is a is a term for a funeral shroud essentially. Nice. And she's surrounded by male suitors who want to marry her, assuring her that Odysseus will never return home. And she says, well, as soon as I finish weaving the winding sheet on my loom, I will choose one of you to marry. So she weaved all day her patterns, but at night when the suitors disappeared, she undid the thread so that she never made any progress. But uh, she, in fact, what happened was over time, Odysseus did return from his travels and they were reunited and they lived presumably happy ever after, happily ever after. So the point of Toynbee's um, metaphor was that progress does happen, it just not in the linear, obvious way that we think it happens. Um so that the Middle East is not all going to convert into democracies, into stable democracies, and live happily, happily ever after in a globalized world. No, the lesson of the loom of time is that the Middle East will make progress. There is a path out of this morass, 
but it's not going to follow a Western script and it's not going to be obvious and it's going to be a lot of dips and turns and pivots and all kinds of things are go are are, are going to happen. It, you know, it'll be a mess, a very messy enterprise. And I might add, it took Great Britain 700 years to go from the Magna Carta to the great reform laws of the late 19th century and women's suffrage of the early 20th century. So why should any Middle East country be able to presto become a functioning, uh, a functioning um, stable democracy overnight just because we will it so? That's a, that's a good way to put it. You know, I'm, I'm listening to you describe the idea that uh, Penelope and Odysseus did have a happily ever after. I was just thinking, not if you read Tennyson, because of course Tennyson imagines that Ulysses comes home and then eventually gets bored and has to leave again, which yeah, I think also, which, yeah. which contributes even to this idea that we don't know how it's going to end. The story to never ends. The story never ends. And so the idea that we're sort of, there, there are, there are threads that we can see of development, but that then there are, there are backtracks and there are, there, there are, are things that slow down the progress or move in another direction. Um, is of course a something that Americans can be very impatient with that because we you know, we like to think that you know, things are going in a particular direction and we're moving in that direction and if we're not moving things in the proper direction then somebody's not doing their job um, and so in this conversation today I want to talk a little bit about what you what you felt and learned and heard on the ground and we'll talk about what it means uh, and what it can mean for yeah. policy. Americans are addicted to linear thinking. Yeah, you know, to linear progress you know, essentially, that you go from step A to step B to step C, or else we'll take your foreign aid away from you, basically. <laughs> That's not how the world works. Right. No, very true. Very true. Well, good. Well, um, so as we get started, I want to remind audience members that you know Bob and I are going to start start out with our conversation, but you are welcome to join us using the Q&A feature in the webinar. Please use the Q&A, not the, not the chat feature. Um, and, then, um, and then we'll be able to see how things go from there. But Bob, I want to start with the geographical question because you have some very interesting observations about geography when you talk about the Nile or even when you talk about the, the geographical or the political impossibility of Pakistan, which is also a product of its geography. And that is when people talk about the greater Middle East, but the, the subtitle of your book is uh, uh, from the Mediterranean to China. And I said, I said from the Mediterranean to the Gobi looking for connections, but when same people talk thing. about the Middle East, same thing, right? But when we think about the, um, the, uh, the, the greater Middle East, right, it can re reach all the way from Gibraltar to the Gobi. Um, if people think of, of the, the, the states of Northern Africa, North Africa as part of this. Yeah. And so how do we make sense of a region that is so vast? What is it that links, that makes this one region rather than a series of distinct regions, at least in, in all right. Analysis. First of all, I call it the greater Middle East rather than the conventional Middle East, because it includes Greece, because Greece is Eastern Orthodox, remember. Right. It starts with Eastern Orthodoxy, and it includes China, because Western China is actually East Turkestan, the easternmost bound you know, area of the Turkic speaking peoples, which is why we have all this disruption in Xinjiang and Western China. So right. that's one thing. The other thing is that um, it's the greater Middle East, because it's the area between the stable Western democracies of Europe and the, and the, uh, the deep textured civilizations of India and China. Essentially, okay. every place in between is part of the greater Middle East and it's disruptive. It's been unstable. It has very little to unite it. You have the Persians, you have the Egyptians, all these places are different. And most of all, and this may be jumping ahead a bit, Ron, but for hundreds and upon hundreds of years, for millennia, in fact, the, the, this large area was ruled by empires. And I don't mean the British, French, they came late to the story. You know, I mean the Omayyad Empire in, based in Damascus, an Arab empire that ruled everywhere from Gibraltar to Persia, essentially, from Morocco to Persia. I mean the Abbasid dynasty, which also ruled basic, based in Baghdad, which basically ruled the same area 
you know, you know, from mm -hmm. from North Africa all the way to Persia. And then I mean, of course, the Fatimids, the Hafsids, the others. This was all imperial, uh, you know, so it prevented state formations. And without state formations, democracy becomes that much harder. And then, of course, you had the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which mm -hmm. ruled for 400 years or more from what is today Algeria to what is today Iraq, essentially, and in north into the Balkans and south to Yemen, um, essentially. They ruled. And, you know, some one thing I say in the book is that the, the Ottoman Turkish Empire collapsed after World War One. It formally came to an end in 1922 or thereabouts. Um, the Middle East has still not figured out a solution to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And that's what all these headlines and turmoil is about. Because under the Ottomans or under the Omayyads or the Abbasids, nobody was fighting about which territory that one controlled. Yeah, um, because it was all they were all subjects of the Sultan. Yeah. And well, as and subjects that, yeah. of the Sultan, there were no Ge there were no geographical fights about who owned what and which people were there first, kind of. Well, and I think that's interesting because what makes empires different from, say, large territorial states is empires have with, within a larger uh, so overarching suzerainty, there, uh, there can be a great deal of local influence and local control as empires collaborate with local elites. But yes, that, but it's and and so those those elites persist. Um, and of course, then when, and, and we are coming up on, I was thinking about this as preparing this, right? Next year will be the hundredth anniversary of the, uh, 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 of the, the, the final treaties that it was at San Stefano that finally, uh, you know, set the borders of modern Turkey. And so end yeah. the Ottoman empire for good. Right. So, so we've been dealing with this for a hundred years. Yes. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and also, um, empires remember were flexible. They were cosmopolitan. Yep. They were in many ways forgiving a soft form of sovereignty. And when empires collapsed, especially in Europe, with the collapse of the Habsburg Austrian Empire and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, what we got was fascism. You know, mm -hmm. and mono ethnic states where which was tyranny by the majority, because the empires protected minorities. You know, which yeah. is something that the states that 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 followed them did not. Yeah, I mean, and which is the, the great paradox of of modern uh, sort of twentieth century geopolitics is the idea that uh, the creation of mono ethnic nation states was supposed to be this great advance, when all yeah. it has led is to this uh, sort of vicious fighting over over borders and boundaries. Well, and and then we're getting into one of the big questions here, and that is, um, you know, we live in a world now where the empires are gone, but their their traces remain and their echoes remain. And to yeah. try to figure out, you know, how should these newly, these, these political entities that are defined as nation states, even though they're not quite nation states, how should they deal with both their past in developing their own governments, but also in their relations with each other? Like, let's, we'll start, we'll talk about the Turks, because I think that you have some All right, well, let me just there. make a yeah. distinction. There's a di dichotomy here before we get to the Turks. Yeah. You have like, you know, age old clusters of civilizations like Egypt and Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Tunisia has been essentially a place, an identifiable place with an identity and a patriotism almost that goes back to Roman times, you know, and Egypt goes back even further, thousands of years. So when something disruptive like the Arab Spring happened, they had changes of regime, but nothing fell apart. The government was still there. The people were still there. Um, you didn't have instability, really. It was just a matter of who would rule. But yeah. then you had these places, which I call vague geographical expressions, like Libya, like Syria, like Iraq, like Yemen, which as soon as you know their dictators were removed, they just fell apart because they were never meant to be states in the first place, or they, you know, they were weak states you know, so to speak. Right. Well, and, and that's what I think is, this is what makes the, the discussion of Turkey so interesting. Is yes. That the Turks lose their empire, 
but they are able um, in the struggle between say 19, 1920 and 1923, they break the Treaty of Sevres, they're able to establish new borders and establish sort of a sense of, okay, this is Turkey. But of course, it didn't solve all the problems because it's still left open the question of the Kurds, for example. But the idea that the Turks have tried to marry a modern nationalist sensibility with a with with uh, references to their past Ottoman imperial heritage, and this all kind of comes together with uh, with uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan as president of Turkey. And how can we understand Turkey's place as both contemporary nation and uh, I don't know, and and uh, imperial an empire. shadow, an empire? Yeah, yeah. yeah how do we, how do we make sense? Turkey, of Turkey is the modern day remnant of the Ottoman empire, which was largely Turkish, though not completely Turkish, headquartered in Constantinople, today Istanbul. And what happened in Turkey was, you know, when Ataturk took over after being a war hero in World War I, he essentially got rid of the limbs. He said Turkey had no claim to its former imperial holdings in the Balkans or in the northern Levant, the Middle East. And he constant and he said Turkey is only Anatolia, uh, essentially Asia Minor essentially. But Turkey, you know, but the Turks were educated still, nevertheless, in the sense that they could be proud of their imperial past. You mm. know, that's another thing. Empire is not a dirty word in the middle. You know, it's not a dirty word in Turkey or in Iran or in Russia or in China. They're proud of their empires. They're not apologizing for them, essentially. Mm. And Ataturk started a modern state. He created a modern state. Later on, though, you had a ruler like uh, a prime minister like Turgut Özal in the uh, in the 1980s, early 1990s, who brought back the Ottoman past, not in terms of aggression, but in terms of work, you know, in terms of economic outreach to the greater Middle East and to the Balkans. And and so he and he was also more religious. Ataturk was secular. But Turgut Özal turned out to be a transition figure because the real revolution or counter-revolution happened with Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who's been in ruling Turkey now for 20 years, over 20 years. And he brought the country back fully to the old time religion, to Islam, and openly uh, you know, took an aggressive attitude in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, you know, saying, you know, Turkey has an Ottoman past. This is our area, essentially, not to own and control, but to have influence in dramatic influence. So Erdogan has basically brought back the Ottoman Empire as something to be celebrated and proud of, uh, which is a 180 degree turn from where uh from where Ataturk had take had taken it. Now with Erdogan getting old and there's a lot of opposition to him, despite him being reelected recently, um, Turkey is betwixt and between Turks. They're proud of their Ottoman past. They're proud of their imperial past, but they also know that they have to get along in the region. You know, mm -hmm. right? Well, and and that's what I find find interesting is the struggle. The struggle for a region which, for outsiders, we think of it as a region, uh, an Arabic-speaking region, and yet the, its two big competitors for dominance are have for a long time been the Turks and the Persians, right? Neither of right. neither of them yeah. being being Arabs, and yet, and so that raises the question of you know what role do the Arabs play in the Middle yeah. East? Yeah, and there's also a geographical aspect of this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the Turks and the Persians live in high mountainous plateau areas. Whereas the Arabs live in flat desert areas. Um, and the Turks and the Persians are heir to great empires, you know, and um, and you know, and and, and they're and they're comparatively very sophisticated and urbanized and wealthy, whereas the Arab states are at a, is it are you know are at an earlier form of development. Uh, right. so there's still this tension between the Turks and the Persians and the Arabs and between the Turks and the Persians themselves, um, um, obviously. So it's not only the Arabs. Where do the Arabs stand in all of this? Well, 
The Arabs think differently in each Arab country. That's one thing I found out was uh, in my travels was that each country was going through its going through a different drama, mm. so to speak, under different circumstances. Right. And and when I think about the, the those dramas, Bob, so the combination of the, the two big dramas I saw were Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I don't know which order you want to take them in, but as two different examples of this kind of, uh, you know, the, this particular sort of Arab struggle. And so, yeah, uh, which well, one would you like to cover first? All right. I, I spent weeks doing many interviews in each country, you mm -hmm. know. And where is the where is the, the the liberal elite media covers Egypt or has covered Egypt as in terms of only a human rights problem, mm -hmm. in terms of you know the dictator Abdel Fattah el Sisi commits terrible human rights atrocities, which he does. Um, I looked at it in a more historical vein, which is since 1952. Egypt has been ruled by Nasserite pharaohs, you know, Nasser setting the blueprint, you know, essentially. And, um, you know, he was a military man and he was followed by Sadat, who is followed by Hosni Mubarak, who is followed, you know, uh, uh, who is followed after an inter a democratic interruption that led to chaos um, to uh, to Al Sisi. And and, you know, and my you know, what I learned was Egypt has to find a way out of rule by the Nasserite pharaohs. Mm -hmm. But it but the two or three years that Egypt experimented with democracy were a disaster, you know, essentially. Uh, Egypt, remember, is largely proletariat, largely poor with ur urban poor heavily Islamic, all these things made democracy very difficult and led to a very weak democratic government that was that led to chaos and led to, it, it was toppled very easily. People forget that in the first year or two of al-Sisi's regime in 2013, 2014, 2015, al-Sisi was very popular. Hmm. You know, he was seen as a respite from the chaos that Egyptians had experienced, but he's fallen into the old ways. And the real old way, the real problem that bedevils Egypt is that the military controls the economy. Um, and in this age, in this digital postmodern high tech age that requires a lot of innovation and fewer bureaucratic controls, it's impossible for a country to prosper if it's under the rule of a very hierarchical, vertical, risk averse, um, heavily bureaucratic military, which has no experience with economics in the first place, mm -hmm. essentially. And it seems that the last thing that Al Sisi will do is take the economy away from the military. You know, that's the basis of his rule, essentially. So that's the problem that bedevils Egypt. You know, mm. the Nasserite pharaohs can rule, but they cannot rule effectively and successfully. Um, it's kind of rule by compulsion, um, so to speak. Um, and yet, <clears throat> If, an, if, if a free and fair democratic election were held, you might, I say might, have the same level of chaos as you had before. And there's no, there's no, I see no path to transitioning to that. Also, keep in mind that al-Sisi, behind the scenes, has, with his security services, has had the best relationship with Egypt, with Israel, rather, that one can ever imagine. I mean, behind the scenes, he's almost indispensable to Israeli security. Hmm. And in fact, Egypt has be been behind a lot of the negotiations regarding ceasefires, hostages in Gaza and all of that, all because of al-Sisi, essentially. So the West is really bedeviled. Um, mm -hmm. They, you know, on an on values proposition they don't like him they don't want him 
But on an interest-based proposition, for the moment, they cannot do without him. Well, and and this is this is both a, a particular problem with Egypt, but it's something we can also the transition for the talk about Saudi Arabia as well. Because the way that you describe uh, the situation, and and I'd say a theme that runs through this book, is something that ran through your previous book on the tragic mind is that um, there are some places where the, the 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 danger of chaos is so great that uh, a degree of of authority is necessary in order to, to hold it off the question is uh, is there a transition to popular government ever can there be um if we if 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 lcc is that's the you know, stipulate LCC is doing a reasonably good job and he's doing a lot of a lot of positive things. He's holding off chaos, but there is no path forward to uh to popular government. Then what stops LCC from becoming just as uh sclerotic and bureaucratic and inefficient as Hosni Mubarak was by uh, 2011? Nothing. nothing at all. Nothing. Right? Just nothing. I guess not, the strength of not character, every perhaps. problem has a solution. You know, there you go. And this yeah. is the conundrum of Egypt. You know, we yeah. believe in happy endings. That's not true almost anywhere, especially in the Middle East. Right. Um, but uh, no, there's nothing to stop it at this point. Um, uh, you know, I, I one of the people, one of the many people I interviewed in Egypt was, um, uh, 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 you know, a, a very prominent human rights campaigner. Um, and he told me that all Egyptian dis dictators start well, you know, their first 10 years are innovative. There are some reforms. People are happy that they're there. Life is stable. It's predictable. In the second decade is where the problems creep in. And it keeps getting worse and worse. Um, and that's what happened with Mubarak. And that's mm -hmm. what happened. That's what's happening with El Sisi, who is now in the second decade of his rule. I mean, it, it, there's a paradox. I, I should have looked this up before this conversation, but I'll, 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 I won't look it up live. But it it makes me think about how the success that Ataturk had as a authoritarian modernizer um, that in Turkey he was successful in part because he didn't last much longer than a decade. As, no, and, and so no. he didn't he didn't stay he around lasted long about, 15 up, about 15 and years and he never really democratized the country right. the per the, the turkish leader who led to democracy more was ismet inunu you know who mm -hmm. followed ataturk but ataturk was a lot of things a lot of progressive things but a democrat he was not he was really. not and it, it turned out it was and, and essentially he was that was a problem for future generations right he had enough to do and if he if ataturk had lived for another 30 years um you know to to into his dotage as 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 other authoritarian leaders perhaps he would have faced these challenges but instead he essentially passed them to another generation. Yeah. It's different though, if you are a young and vigorous guy who happens to have all kinds of authority at your disposal, like I don't know, somebody like say Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And yeah. how how do we understand his, both both the Saudi Arabian problem and what's, what Mohammed bin Salman is offering as a solution uh, to it? Okay. Um, a, a Saudi notable put it to me this way. He said, you want us to be democratic. We saw what happened in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Yemen, in Libya, in Syria and Iraq. It's all chaos and destruction, you know? Meanwhile, the Saud family has had, has been in power for over a hundred years. There's been like not barely a day of chaos, maybe a week of chaos. We've had half a dozen changes of power. Um, they've all gone smoothly. Even when King Faisal was assassinated in 1975, they had a new ruler within 48 hours, uh, you know, King Khalid, who ruled like all the others as a moderate, enlightened conservative, given the Saudi reality. So do you want us to adopt your political values? You know, no way, you know, no ever. We like our stability, our predictability, you know, et cetera. Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, NBS as he is known, comes to power you know, to de facto power, because his father, King Salman, is, is officially the ruler. Um, and he comes to de facto power. And he says Saudi Arabia has to change and change dramatically, because oil and gas are not going to be as valuable in future decades as they are now. We need to have a highly entrepreneurial, adaptable society. 
And, and that means a lot of things. The first, one of the things it means is we have to liberate women, allow them to drive, to work, to participate in the society. Because if you can liberate half the population, you change the behavior of the other half you know, essentially. So you have basically a real social revolution. We also have to stabilize our relationship with Israel because Israel is a high tech digital powerhouse and we need their technological expertise to help us in confronting the challenge of Iran and the Ayatollahs. Um, uh, you, know, you know, all these things come, come together in terms of positioning Saudi Arabia to be relevant and successful in the post-oil you know, post natural gas um, age, so to speak. Now, Mohammed bin Salman is very innovative. He's basically improved de facto behind the scenes relations with Israel to a greater degree than any Arab leader since Anwar Sadat. You know, um, he's an authoritarian, he's done terrible things. Washington is fixated with these terrible things, or was until a few months ago, essentially. But again, like El Sisi, behind the scenes, who's going to pay for the rebuilding of Gaza? MBS, you know, or you know, or he'll he'll be a part of it. Who, you know, who's going to pay for? Who's going to help stabilize the region? Uh, you know, it, it's going to be the, you know the Al Saud, the Al Sauds in Saudi Arabia etc. So again, we're back to the same thing. On a values proposition, Americans cannot be comfortable with MBS. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but ruling is not just a matter of, you know, a foreign policy is not just a matter, as the late Henry Kissinger said, of, of, of what is just, but what is possible. What is possible. Um, yeah. And what is just is only about your own values. What is possible has to take into account the, the values of people you're dealing with half a world away. Well, and this gets this gets to an interesting question. And I, I, Greg Bloomquist has the question is, you know, should should popular government or uh, be a goal anywhere? Uh, should the United States simply become more comfortable with a variety of governments? That's something that maybe, you know, so, so let's say we we slough off the, the concern about encouraging popular government. I want to ask, um, I was going to say this question for later, but I'm going to ask it now and we'll come back to other stuff later. And that is one can criticize the United States for a lot of things. And one can criticize the United States for being perhaps too fixated at times on talking about democracy and wish that we just allowed things to uh, take their course. At the same time, however, the United States also has taken a great deal of criticism, absorbed a great deal of criticism in the region for supporting authoritarian regimes that don't have popular support. And then when those regimes are swept away, the United States' influence is also swept away. We look, think about Iran, for example. And so if the argument is on the one hand, right, the United States needs to stop talking about democracy and we need just to figure out what's possible. Okay. Um, but how does that, um, you know, if, if, we, if we no longer care about values or democracy or human rights, and we're competing with a global challenger in China that also doesn't care about humanity, uh, human rights or democracy, um, on what basis are we competing? Um, and right. are, you know, would we All end right. up, are we undermining our own interests? Just because you're not putting a gun to people's heads and say, hold elections now or within the next year or two, doesn't mean that we don't care about values and human rights. You know, there's a middle ground here. Okay. We should support civil society everywhere protection of minorities everywhere. We can reward or punish regimes on the basis of that. But we shouldn't be demanding elect formal elections everywhere, you know, and um, that's that's the distinction, uh, you know, essentially. Um, and I think we follow that, you know, behind the scenes, even, you know, the, the Biden administration with its, you know, with its symposium for democracy, it's, you know, it's. Um, 
you know, these conventions it holds of all democratic countries. When when the Secretary of State meets with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia or the Saudi foreign minister or the Egyptian foreign minister, he's not demanding that they hold elections. You know, he's not doing anything even close to the sort. He may mm -hmm. bring up issues like human rights and treatment of prisoners and things, and we would like these people released, and here's a list of them. You know, he you know, he, you know, he can do that, but that's a long way from telling people what system of government they should have. Um, uh, you know, often human rights get improved when the Americans basically argue for it behind the scenes. And when it happens a bit, the Americans do not publicly take credit for it. You know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they let the, they let the regime take credit for it, um, kind of. Um, so there's that's the difference between vir virtue signaling, which is, you know, we wanted you to hold elections and actually dealing with, you know, with regimes that whose historical experience is much different than ours. Right. Well, again, because you, 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 you raised that interesting point that was brought up in Saudi Arabia, that when the Biden administration held their conference on democracies, that they invited the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, but not Singapore. Um, yes. It, and, and, and the Saudis yeah. brought that up to me very angrily. Right. They said, what kind of a foreign policy does your country have? You know, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the government barely controls any territory outside of the capital city. You know, you know, is this an avatar to hold up and look at Singapore, you know, which has gone from one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the highest qualities of life in the world since the 19 the, since the mid 1960s. Um, so that, you know, that's something that the Saudis kept mentioning. They kept using it as a soundbite to me. Right. Um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo versus Singapore, because and this brings me to something else. The Saudi regime and other regimes throughout the greater Middle East, when you ask them who their hero is, who they look up to, they always say Lee Kuan Yew. Mm -hmm. They never say Nelson Mandela or Václav Havel. They say Lee Kuan Yew, because Lee took one of the poorest corrupt societies in the world and made it civil. Mm -hmm. You know, he made it prosperous through te through technocracy, through fair dealing, through through bureaucratic efficiency, through lack of corruption. Right. And then I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that, by by that uh sort of the positive fixation, let's say, on Singapore, which raises, of course, a fascinating ge geographical question, is um, is Singapore's success, which after all is built around a city-state that was a trading hub before, it, even when it was poor, it was a trading hub. Yeah. Um, uh, is that scalable to the size um, of a kingdom like Saudi Arabia? I don't believe it is, but yeah. the Saudis think it is. The Saudis think yeah. it is, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They think it's scalable. Mm -hmm. I have my doubts, you know. Singapore, as you say, is a small city state of of dynamic overseas Chinese traders, essentially. Right. Um, while Saudi Arabia is a vast desert, it's so big that it has snow in the north while it's uh, in the winter, <laughs> while it's sweltering hot in the south near the border with Yemen. Um, so that I don't think it's scalable, um, but it, I think it's relevant that MBS has Lee Kuan Yew as a role model. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, in other words, it, they might not get there, but the, the, there may be some virtuous uh, r results of them trying to get there. Right, they, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting way to put it. Well, um, when we talk about elections, and especially elections in the Middle East, right, the example that is often brought up is the, the catastrophic elections in the Palestinian territories, especially in Gaza, which resulted in Hamas seizing power through an election yeah. and essentially never giving it back. And so two parts connected to that, right? Amri Brenner asks about, you know, what is the possibility of the future of a Palestinian state in general in the region? And then I want to piggyback on that and say, what does the war in Gaza do? Yeah, we, obviously you finished the book before the war broke out in Gaza. I'm yeah. sure you've asked a lot, answered a lot of questions about it now. Is uh, you know, Jake Sullivan famously had to scrub sections of his uh, self-congratulatory piece in Foreign Affairs uh, once the war breaks out because everybody thought the Palestinian question had been essentially put on ice forever. Guess not. So what what does the re 
the reboiling of the Palestinian question do to our thinking about the, the present and the future of the greater Middle East? First of all, I left Israel out of the book, you know, mm, and the I reason did I that, yeah. did so was because Israel's in a different category. The theme of the book was how do you find, how do you get to somewhere in the middle, in the comfort? civil society middle between tyranny on one end and anarchy on the other. That's what the book's about. Um, and Israel just is irrelevant to that question because it's had a functioning democracy for 75 years. Not, not always a well-functioning one, not one without tension, but a functioning democracy. Um, and um, you know, so and and so I basically left Israel Palestine out of the book, and I'm glad I did so because if I included it, I probably would have gotten a lot wrong given what's happened since October 7th, you know. For sure. But there is one part of the book where I'm interviewing the head of the Arab League in Cairo, um, who tells me that there will be no stability in the region until the Palestinian problem is at least addressed to a much greater extent than the uh, conservative right-wing government in Israel feels comfortable addressing it. Saying, you know, he didn't say solved. He says, you can't have a stable region when you have millions of Palestinians disenfranchised. And I quoted him on that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's in the book. And that's, you know, and um, the people who said, for instance, that the Palestinians can be bypassed have been proven wrong, you know, as you know, essentially. But the problem remains how do you know the West Bank is unstable, it's full of corruption, it's full of autocracy. Um, it's um, but yet all right, you can argue, well, if you give the Palestinians their rights, a lot of things might improve, you know? That's true. But remember, the settlers movement has carved up the West Bank, so it's ink blots of settlements when you look at a map of the West Bank. I mean, that's that's happened, you know, it's a fait accompli. We may not like it, but that, you know, that's where it is, um, essentially. The only solution is... For the Palestinians to accept what's left, you know, in Gaza and everything, in return for billions upon billions of dollars of aid money from Saudi Arabia and Europe and the U.S. and elsewhere that will rebuild the West Bank, rebuild Gaza, have like a high speed rail between Gaza and the West Bank, all that kind of thing. And it, you know, and it could be a very imperfect democracy. You know, or it no. might be an autocracy, except just not a lethal one, you know, you yeah. know, not a lethal and corrupt one. There's no easy solution here. I don't have a, you know, I, I don't have a game plan. It's no, you know, it's no surprise that what stump what stumps the Americans, the Israelis, and the Arabs now, one thing nobody has any real ideas about or any or can agree upon is what is a post-war Gaza look like. You know, right. and what does a post Gaza war West Bank look like? Yeah. You know, this is you know, this is sort of the ultimate question. And, and, and but there's something else playing out which does deal with my book. I deal with how essentially the Arab autocrats, let's narrow it down to Al Sisi and MBS in Saudi Arabia. Oh, and King who's King Abdullah in Jordan, right? You know, you know, et cetera. They may not be your idea of liberal humanists, you know, but they keep order and they're very, very useful at times like this, you know, in terms of back channels, using their intelligence services, you know, helping to negotiate ceasefires and, 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 you know, and hostage exchange, you know, exchanges, and, um, and all of that. And what's playing out, why Secretary of State Blinken is so insistent that Israel fight a more humane war, you know, you know, and all this, this is not virtue signaling. This right. is just telegraphing to these Arab dictators who we claim we don't like, but when we go to bed at night, hope they stay in power, 
essentially. It's telegraphing to them that we have your back. We don't like what the Israelis are doing either, you know, and all. And we're saying so publicly. So your populations don't need to riot in the streets because we're on the same side. We're just trying to be an interlocutor. You know, you have this situation where you have Arab autocrats you know, basically going to bed each night, hoping the Israelis defeat Hamas and getting up in the morning, denouncing the Israelis for the sake right. of keeping peace among their populations. Well, and, and that's what it, it's a shame. <clears throat> and I don't want to I don't want to be flip about this, but it's a shame that there aren't leaders in Gaza who imagine turning Gaza into Singapore, because geographically that makes a little bit more sense. Oh, than turning it's got Saudi a great Arabia. sea coast. Right. You know, it's in the heart of the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, it could be a tourist Mecca, you know, could be a lot of things. It has right. history, archaeological sites. Right. Right. Well, and, and so here we get, um, I mean, there, there's a lot of different directions to go in, but, you know, we've, we've got about 15 minutes left and uh, I haven't really brought in the Chinese, so I'm going to have to now. And that is, so all this stuff's going on in this region. And Henry Kissinger recently died. And one of Henry Kissinger's signal accomplishments, right? We could say whether it was good or bad, but his signal accomplishments was clearing the field in the Middle East so that the United States and the United States alone, right? Not the Soviets, not the Europeans. And back then, certainly the Chinese didn't even come into play. But the United States alone was the superpower responsible for keeping order and managing all the relationships in the Middle East. Um, one could say that that particular Kissingerian construction is finally coming to an end, for better or for worse. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And and so what is going to be the role of China in this region? Will the Chinese want to get involved diplomatically or will they just look to make money and let the United States take the heat for dealing with yeah. security? All right. Just a footnote, a plug here. Sure. And the plug is see the movie Golda. It's actually huh. an excellent intelligent film about the 1973 war and 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 Kissinger's diplomacy. It's not one of these mindless, you know, brainless Hollywood movies. It's a it's a very serious movie and it's worth seeing. Um is that right. Helen Mirren as Golda in that movie? Helen Mirren is Golda and sh the great Lev Schreiber is Kissinger, who's um, you know, it, it's a serious performance. Um uh what Kissinger did more than that, up until he got involved in Middle East diplomacy, there was like a war between Israel and Syria, Israel and Egypt, like every 10 years, yeah. you know, yeah. major tank wars, everything. He essentially made a peace. He took Egypt off the battlefield and he made a de facto peace with Soviet allied Syria and Israel that lasted until the Syrian state itself started to come apart in 2011, you know? So you're right. He removed the Soviets, you know, any outside power from the Middle East, essentially. Um, all right. The Chinese, as you said, were not relevant then. They were still under Mao's, you know, it was stark poverty and authority and totalitarianism. The China now is wealthy, you know, relatively wealthy. It's um, it's buying, it, you know, it's the biggest buyer of oil and gas from Iran, from Saudi Arabia. Um, it's building vast complexes in Egypt, both to um, uh, both a new capital east of, of Cairo, a prosperity zone in the, in the Suez Canal. The Chinese are everywhere. And although we won't have time to talk about it, the book includes Ethiopia. And if you look does, at the yeah. skyline of Addis Ababa today, it's mainly all buildings built by the Chinese or in some cases by the UAE, the United mm -hmm. Arab Emirates. So the Chinese are literally everywhere. And they're interested in military involvement too. And um, the one thing that we have is we don't know what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years. But for the moment, it's only the United States that could provide security for Israel, for Saudi Arabia, for Egypt. You know, the Chinese are not up to that. And they're perfectly willing to, 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 to let us have the burden, you know, of doing that. So the, there's a lot we could still offer. Look, the future Middle East is going to be a place of vast Chinese trading, you know, uh, American security, 
And if there can ever be some sort of an imperfect, you know, uh, you know, you know, solution with uh, of the Palestinian problem is, you know, as imperfect as it is, at least to stabilize it, so to speak, the Middle East may not be a bad place at all looking mm -hmm. into the future. That is, I will say, we, we still got a few more minutes to go, but that's that's the most hopeful thing I've heard anybody say about the Middle East in a long time, Bob. Uh, yeah. We're going to have to hold yeah. on to that. Well, I have a couple of questions coming in that are that are that maybe have short answers before we get to a couple of big philosophical ones. So here's a, a oh. Alexander Vershbo asked the question is, will any of the Arab leaders be ready to step up to lead a peacekeeping force in Gaza? Right. Do you see any of the Arab I, states being willing to do um, that? You know, that's a very interesting question, you know. Um, they would only step up to lead a peacekeeping mission if there was if it, if they were assured that there was already peace. In other words, UN peacekeepers go all over the world and they're not great fighters because they don't have to shoot. They just right. have, you know, you know, we had a Sinai peacekeeping mission in Sinai for like 40 years because Kissinger had already made the peace between right. Egypt and, and Israel. If we can demonstrate that there's real peace, stability, the parties have all agreed, and for the next 20 years, we're going to have a formal peacekeeping commission. Sure, you know, you know, peacekeeping force. Sure, I can imagine it, you know, yeah. of course. But there has to be peace first. They can't right. go in there to make peace. Peace has to come first or yeah. else the Saudis and the Egyptians will want nothing to do with it and others uh, because the Egyptians really want no part of Gaza. It was a headache for them between 1948 and 1967. I will say that's a fascinating aspect of all this is how how little the Egyptians, even as they control the crossing there at Rafah, how little they want to do with uh, with uh, with Gaza, they don't want. Yeah, any no, Gaza was a total headache for them. They used it against Israel. Nas Nasser used it mm -hmm. in the war of attrition in the late 1960s. But it's um, you know it was a headache for Egypt, and and that's why Al Sisi want he doesn't want Gazans coming into Egypt. He's not crazy, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, and and going back to our discussion of Singapore and trading partners, uh, an anonymous attendee asks. What about the relevance of the Gulf Arabs in places like Dubai in this region? How do we understand the uh, this person actually mentions call, refers to them as the Dubai as the money laundering capital of the world? I'll leave that uh, for for uh, that be that's an interesting competition between them and the Caymans and some other folks. But the yeah. uh, uh, but <laughs> that'd be an interesting uh, that that's a whole different show. But the but the question of the Gulf Arabs, the amount of wealth and power concentrated in small areas. And how yeah. they try to punch above their weight. The, the Qataris yeah. come. Yeah, well, the Qatar is the ultimate example of punching right. above your weight. They host the World Cup. They've made these hostage trades, you know, between Israel and Hamas. Um, the, you know, the Gulf Arabs are the ultimate Machiavellian empiricists. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, in the sense, it's almost valueless diplomacy. When the, the Abraham Accords wasn't about embracing each other, though they did some of that, you know, with kosher restaurants in Dubai and, and all of that. It was mainly about we have a problem with Iran. Uh, the Americans are less reliable than they used to be. And meanwhile, Israel has all this high tech, sophisticated military technology and not just military technology it can be applied to the consumer you know, economic sphere as well. So they saw the, you know, the Abraham Accords as sort of a friendly acquisition. You know, mm -hmm. they were acquiring Israel for a certain, for a few specific purposes, um, so to speak. Again, it's very Machiavellian. It's all about interests. And remember, the Gulf Arab states never fought a war with Israel. It's not right. like the Egyptians who fought several. Right. or the Jordanians, you know, they never sent forces to Israel. So they, they were never emotionally involved in the Arab-Israeli dilemma, you know, or dispute as were as the Egypt, as Al-Sisi has to deal with, you know, even, right. even right. today, we right. still have a lot of widows, you know, you know, in, in Egypt who were killed in this, in the wars. Um, so the Gulf Arabs will look at this in a very Machiavellian way, but with one thing, they know that as long as the Palestinian issue is not addressed, if it's not addressed, they have to keep their own, they have to keep it a cold peace with Israel right. because they're afraid of their own population 
complaining, rising up, what have you. Sure. I can totally see that. Well, first of all, Greg Bloomquist says Machiavellian empiricism sounds like a great title for your next book. Uh, when, <laughs> if I think about that, but, um, but actually, since you mentioned Egypt and memories of the war, there is one of, 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 let's say empirical question that Josh Shlomish asked. And it's a quote that I remember from the book as well. And that's in the book, you re you twice refer to Nasser falling for Israel's trap in 1967. And um, how uh, this, this the whole question of the the the, the rush to war in sixty seven? You know, Nasser, of course, was beating the drums pretty heavy for war. But what, why do you consider that he fell into Israel's trap? Because remember, Nasser, who is always much younger than he looked, he uh, aged very quickly. When Nasser, but it after Nasser had essentially got rid of the the the, the British and the French and the Israelis in the 1956 war and liberated the Suez Canal um he was he was he was worshiped mm -hmm. he was worshiped throughout the Arab world um you know he and remember this was the age of the east bloc of ideologies and his third world ideology transfixed the average arab in the street he was you know after after 56 you had the the coup d'etat in iraq that killed the king military officers came to power you had coups in syria elsewhere all this was copycatting nasser because nasser was so revered and Nasser felt that he owed it to the to the Arabs. He had sold them on the notion that we would liberate Palestine next, um, you know, you know, and he knew he couldn't do it. But he had fallen into his own trap of being so charismatic that people in the street felt that he could do anything, essentially. So he made a bunch of moves in the. Um, you know, in, you know, prior to the 67 war, I think it was closing off the Straits of Tehran. I can't remember exactly. And the Israelis pounced, you know, yeah. they pounced with a, a, you know, with a preemptive strike. Interesting. I mean, it, it is, it, it's an interesting question, right? There's once you become revered, um, you, you both have to continue to show that you're worthy of being revered, but you can't, you also have to make sure that you don't fail because yeah. you don't want to lose your yeah. nimbus. I was thinking, you know, unrelated, related to the region, if not to the story of your book, right? That's, of course, the, the, the key plot point at the end of The Man Who Would Be King is after successfully becoming king, uh, Sean Connery's character is revealed to to be only a man, and this then undermines yeah. his his claims to divinity. Yeah. So we just have a couple of minutes left, but Fritz Heinzen asks a philosophical question that we can end with, I think. And as we talked about linear and nonlinear thinking and it gets to interesting debates um you know and the idea that nonlinear thinking often triumphs over linear thinking cuz uh, uh, in the in the short term but can you develop a modern country with a stable bureaucracy and a judiciary with nonlinear leadership don't what you do need you to have well, I guess the, the the idea of linear think we talked about how you know the Americans yeah. are fixated it, on linear thinking you can, you you can have a system? stable yeah. democracy um with a stable economy essentially can come about um, not through a process like another Arab Spring, you uh -huh, know. Uh -huh. You know, you know, it could come about by Shakespearean factors. You know, in, in some charismatic leader rises in Iran who's a counter-revolutionary. You know, I go into the fact that I'm actually hopeful about Iran. You know, going ahead the next ten years in the book, we won't have time to talk about that. But, you know, you could, you know, nonlinear often involves Shakespearean characteristics, which means personalities. It's not just geography and vast impersonal forces. It's people. And this is something that diplomats know all about. You know, one thing about Kissinger was he knew all about historical processes, but he knew how to deal with people, with personalities, with Golda Meir, with Anwar Sadat, with Zhou Enlai. Um and others. So yes, this this could come about. Some, you know, you can have some charismatic leader can arise, or you know, or something that that challenges the status quo, and you could have a new a pivot in terms of the direction of history in a specific place. That's that's but that's the that's the uh, the burden and the glory of human life, right? Is that we do have a certain degree of choice and a certain degree yes. of agency. We have to figure out how to use it. Um, and, uh, 
Bob, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we're there. Our hour is up, but this has been a great conversation and we only scratched the surface. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested, the book is indeed the loom of time. Um, it is available in bookstores. Now we thank Bob Kaplan for being here on people, politics, and prose to talk about it, Bob. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And thanks to all of you for joining us. FPRI thanks our sponsors and our partners for their support for programs like this. If you have found this program to be interesting, um, please tell a friend, bring a friend next time. Consider becoming a member, sponsor, partner of FPRI so that you too can help to make conversations like this possible. Because this conversation is just the beginning. The world goes on and we're here to talk about it at FPRI. Uh, please, to keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose and other events at FPRI, visit our website, fpri.org. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on that website that used to be called Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on that website, at Ronald Granary. We look forward to seeing you again next time. But until next time, for all of us at FPRI, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>